significant interview with Shadow Victims Minister Anna McMoran about a coercive relationship she experienced and how she got out. First, it's the news. Good afternoon. It's three minutes past 12. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Now let's begin with that breaking news. The Bank of England has raised interest rates to 0.5%. That's from 0.25%. For more, Liam Halligan, GB News presenter for On The Money, joins us now from Blackpool. Liam, is it yet more bad news for households today? This cost of living squeeze that we've talk, been talking about a lot on GB News, Rhiannon, and on my On The Money show in particular, for weeks and months is now coming to pass. We're seeing the Bank of England raise interest rates from 0.25 to 0.5%. That will impact about 2.5 million homes, mortgage holders who are on standard variable mortgages. It will increase all kinds of personal debt that people may take on in the coming weeks and months as they try to make ends meet. And it's tough, isn't it, that this increase in interest rates coincides with an almost £700 increase in household energy bills for around 22 million families that we just heard Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, unveil in the House of Commons. We're here in Blackpool, of course, because it is GB News Northwest Week. We've been travelling around the Northwest in recent days, testing the mood of ordinary GB views viewers and listeners. We'll be doing that more on my On The Money show at 1pm. Liam, thank you. And as Liam mentioned there, regulator Ofgem has announced a 54% rise in the energy price cap. The change will be introduced from April 1st, affecting around 22 million customers. Those on default tariffs paying by direct debit will see bills increase by a maximum of £693 to £1,000. £971. Prepayment customers will see an increase of £708 to £2,017. Chancellor Rishi Sunak says he will introduce measures giving households in council tax bands A to D an extra £350 to ease the burden. It is not sustainable to keep holding the price of energy artificially low. For me to stand here and pretend we don't have to adjust to paying higher prices would be wrong and dishonest. But what we can do is take the sting out of a significant price shock for millions of families by making sure the increase in prices is smaller initially and spread over a longer period. Well, all that as energy giant Shell has managed to capitalise on soaring gas and oil prices. The company recorded a pre-tax profit of £12 billion in the last three months of 2021, up from almost £900 million in the previous quarter. Shell now plans to return £6.3 billion to investors by buying back their shares. Russia has criticised US plans to send more troops to Eastern Europe, describing the move as destructive. President Joe Biden has ordered nearly 3,000 military personnel to Poland and Romania to bolster NATO defences. Moscow has denied plans to invade Ukraine, but it's understood Russia has now mobilised 115,000 troops on its border. Former UK ambassador Sir Mark Lyle Grant told GB News that the troop deployment is a symbolic measure. They will defend uh, NATO allies militarily if required. So it's more a, a signal to President Putin of America's commitment to European security. We're on something of a knife edge uh, at the moment and we're entering a very dangerous period. The London mayor has called for urgent action after toxic air pollution was found at every hospital and medical centre in the capital. Analysis shows the air quality meets the legal UK limits but fails the stricter World Health Organisation guidelines. Sadiq Khan described the situation as unacceptable and vowed to take steps to tackle the problem. 
The government's being urged to set a clear date in law to ban the sale of new gas boilers. 29 million homes will need new low-carbon heating systems in order to reach 2050 climate goals. The Business, Energy and Industry Committee says the government's approach lacks clear direction and current policies aren't enough. And researchers at Bristol University have developed flying robots the size of insects with flapping wings. Known as micro-air vehicles, they're better than other drones at manoeuvring in tight spaces and resisting air turbulence. The new technology can be used for search and rescue and dangerous environments like collapsed buildings. This is GB News. We'll have more as it happens. But now back to the briefing with Gloria Di Piero. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, energy bills are set to rise by nearly £700 on average and the Chancellor has just been outlining plans to help households deal with that. Our economics editor, Liam Halligan, will talk us through what it means for the money in your pockets. Former Northern Ireland Minister Arlene, Phillips, uh, Arlene Foster excuse me, joins me as Irish sea checks on goods are suspended and First Minister Paul Givan is set to resign. Former International Trade Secretary Dr Liam Fox will also join me. He wants better support for people with Down syndrome. And Labour MP and Shadow Victims Minister Anna McMorrin tells me of a traumatic personal relationship and how she got out. Now, of course, we're going to be talking about the soaring cost of living in the programme after that huge increase in energy bills was announced. But first, if you thought Brexit really was done, think again. Nearly six years on from that leave vote and two years since we finally left, Brexit is still a cause of major tension with the EU in at least one part of the UK, Northern Ireland. The First Minister, Paul Givan, is reported to be about to resign over the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's the deal with the EU, which governs how goods cross the borders. Northern Ireland shares with Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland, which is in the European Union. I'm delighted to say I'm joined now by the former First Minister, Arlene Foster. Now, of course, also my colleague and GB News presenter. Arlene, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Just Good to see you too, Gloria. Yeah. Just tell us I, what... I'm always amazed that Arlene Phillips is brought uh, <laughs> up, but uh, I hope she doesn't mind. <laughs> Bless you. Just tell us, why is it reported that the First Minister will be resigning later today? Well, I think the first stage uh, in the DUP's plan, which to be fair was set out back in September of last year, uh, has come to fruition with the uh, Agriculture Minister indicating that he is stopping and as of last night stopped the uh, additional checks that were put in place by the Northern Ireland Protocol. There were always uh, SPS checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Those are the checks to make sure that there are no diseases coming across. So uh, those have always been in place. Uh, but the difficulty was uh, the European Union through the protocol had imposed uh, an enormous amount of checks, 20% of all checks uh, that happened between the EU and third countries was happening between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So it was completely disproportionate uh, in terms of the risk uh, to the single market. Uh, and it was always said by the DUP that they would take action if the government didn't take action. And I think they felt uh, that the government aren't going to take action and therefore they had to act. Do you believe that Paul Givan, the First Minister, is right to resign? Well, I think the uh, government and particularly the EU who have been ignoring the calls of unionism. I mean, there's not one unionist uh, representative, Gloria, in Northern Ireland that supports the protocol because it takes away the consent of the people of Northern Ireland to rules and regulations that are coming in uh, for goods in Northern Ireland. But the EU has ignored all of that. The EU keeps uh, talking this mantra that they are protecting the Belfast Agreement. Well, actually, what the EU has done has caused a huge damage to the Belfast Agreement, and we will see that playing out in the next couple of days when Paul Given uh, resigns, uh, of course, the First and Deputy First Ministers will then be out of office. The executive of the Northern Ireland Assembly will not be able to meet. Uh, but we know this because, of course, it happened back in 2017 when Sinn Féin uh, walked out of government and therefore brought the executive down at that point. 
So unfortunately, we won't have an executive in Northern Ireland Assembly and the European Union are to blame. Former First Minister and GB News colleague and presenter, thank you for your insights this, this morning. Thank you. This lunchtime, should I say. Dr Liam Fox's proposals to improve support for those with Down syndrome are back in Parliament tomorrow. I'm delighted to say he joins me now. Hello, Gloria. Hi there. Good to see you. you if, I, if I may, um, uh, Liam Fox, could I just start by getting your reaction to Rishi Sunak's uh, economic update, which he has just given uh, in the Commons? And just put to you, that isn't the easiest way to help us all with this cost of living squeeze, is to cut our taxes, not to, to raise them. Well, of course, you have to raise taxes if you're going to raise spending. You can't spend money that you don't have. And if you just borrow to do it, that's a tax on the next generation. So I'm afraid if we have an appetite for spending in the country, which we seem to have, we have to pay for it. It's as simple as that. Uh, what the Chancellor has done today is to uh, diminish the impact that rising world fuel prices are having. But there's only so much that the government can do when it's a, it's a global problem. And of course, we face this, the similar issue of global inflation, particularly inflation in the United States, but also inflation in Britain and other European countries. So uh, it's, a, it's a difficult time. Thank you for that. Now, let's talk about uh, your proposals to help those with Down syndrome. Tell us what you are seeking to do in terms of changing the law. Well, uh, as a result of real improvements in medical science um, over the years, the life expectancy of people with Down syndrome has improved very dramatically. When I was born, it was only about 13 to 15 years. When I became a doctor, it was about 30. Now it's about 60. And that means that we've got the first generation of people with Down syndrome who will outlive their parents. Uh, that clearly causes a huge amount of anxiety to, to, to parents. And if we act now, then we'll be able to avert what would be a perfectly predictable crisis. So what the, uh, the Down syndrome bill that I've put to Parliament does is it, it guarantees uh, for people with Down syndrome uh, that they have access to uh, the appropriate health care and educational help and uh, residential care if required. And it's done by giving, um, first of all, new instructions from the Secretary of State to, to local government or to health authorities. But it also puts a representative on the new integrated care boards who will be there to ensure that the contents of this bill are actually implemented. There's no point in having rights if you can't have them applied. And what prompted you to try and change the law in this area, to bring forward this private member's bill, which has cross-party support, and unlike lots of private member's bills, looks set to, to, to succeed? Yes, well, I hope it will become law um, sometime in March if we get it through the House of Commons tomorrow, which I expect to do, and then through the House of Lords quickly. Well, a, a lot of reasons, Gloria. Um, uh, personal experience, I, 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 the, uh, when I was growing up, boy next door had Down syndrome, a, a very good friend of mine. Uh, their son has Down syndrome. We see it as constituency MPs. You will have seen it that um, parents who have children with Down syndrome, for example, are very often not just fighting to get um, uh, to deal with problems in the educational system, but they're also, they also have complex health needs. They uh, are more likely to have congenital heart defects, more likely to get leukemia, for example. And then you've got the issue of long-term care. So it's because they're fighting on so many fronts. I, I've seen it personally. I've seen it as an MP. I saw it as a doctor. Um, and because we've got this change in demographics, this is the time to act. And, you know, um, there are times in politics where you can actually make a difference uh, if you identify a problem and act quickly enough. And, you know, one of the great uh, privileges of being in public life is actually the ability to, to do that. And it's been wonderful, as you say, that it got government support, but it's had cross-party support. It had unanimity at committee. It's, uh, it's seldom that you see, especially these days, uh, politicians all acting as one because they have all experienced, I think, the complexity of these problems uh, and think that w we need to do something uh, about it and the time to do it is now. 
while I have you, uh, Liam Fox, if, if I may, uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, he has had a bit of a turbulent time of late. I think it is fair to say. Would you say he's safe in his job or just safe in his job for now? Well, I think that we've not yet got closure on some of these issues. Um, we'll get the police report in time. There is no point in continually talking about it because there's nothing new to say at present. Um, and it's not as though we haven't got a lot to get on with. Uh, the rise in inflation and the problems in the global economy post-COVID, uh, the rise in world energy prices, the, the crisis in, in Ukraine at the present time. Uh, and really, are we, do we really think that with nothing new to say on this issue, we're going to take up all the time of not just the Prime Minister, but the Chancellor, the Foreign Secretary, the Defence Secretary, at a time when they need to be focusing on the task in hand. But there's a time for these issues to be dealt with. This is not it. We will get the police report uh, in due time when we will need to get answers to these questions. But for goodness sake, this is not a one-issue country. And just there's so much news around today. If I can just get your reaction to the expectation that the Northern Ireland First Minister is set to resign today. You have lots of experience in these matters. Well, of course, it brings further instability um, into the issue. The Northern Ireland Protocol is, is something that a lot of people are unhappy about, not just in the, the, uh, the unionist community in Northern Ireland, but a lot of Conservatives unhappy about the fact that we effectively have a trade border down the Irish Sea. My, my own view is always that in the end, the natural border is between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic because that is the legal border between the United Kingdom and the European Union. But we've got this agreement, we, we signed up to it, Parliament agreed to it, uh, and we've got to, along with the European Union, and particularly the Irish government, start not with you know, what, what's the best relationship between Britain and the European Union post-Brexit, but what's good for the people of Northern Ireland and for the whole of Ireland. And I think that if we put their interests first and we concentrate on them rather than the political ideology, we're much more likely to come to a, a viable and long-term solution. Dr Liam Fox, you've been very generous with your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thanks very much. Now, the pandemic has been hard for all of us, but children have had a particularly tough time. I'll be talking with Shadow Education Minister Toby Perkins in a moment about how we can help them. Back in a moment. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Now, children have endured almost two years of disrupted education since the pandemic began with severe consequences for their education and in many cases their mental health. There's a debate in Parliament this afternoon specifically on this. To tell us more, I'm delighted to be joined by Shadow Education Minister Toby Perkins. Toby, it's good to see you and before we... Before we chat about the debate in Parliament this afternoon, I just wanted to get your reaction to the Chancellor's uh, economic update, which uh, happened uh, just before we came on air. Your party has been raising the rising cost of living. Energy bills are going to soar. Interest rates are going up. The Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, he's helping people. He's just announced multi-billion pounds worth of help. Credit where credit's due. No, I don't think so. I think it was a hugely disappointing response. I mean, Labour's response to this was that the uh, gas and oil companies have had monstrous increases in their profit profits. We heard very timely just today from Shell a quadrupling in their profits, £19 billion. Uh, and we were looking for a fraction of that um, to uh, be put towards the, the bills of, of people who are hard pressed at the moment. Instead, what Rishi Sunak's done is say he's going to give two hundred pounds uh, off the bill this year, which you will pay back yourselves uh, in a forty pound uh, a year surcharge over the next five years. So, um, you know, I think it's a pitiful response. I'm really surprised, to be honest, from what we were hearing from Tory MPs about their recognition of the need for something to be done. Um, that he he's come up with such so little, and and you know, we've got these higher prices. Uh, and we're all going to be uh, getting a small discount this year that we pay back over the next five. I, I think it's a, a really disappointing response. Thank you for that. Now, to the debate this afternoon. The pandemic has exacerbated mental health issues among children and young people. What should we do about it? What can we do about it? Well, I mean, you're you're absolutely right that the uh, the mental health issues within schools have been really substantial. I think it's been a sort of a child uh, mental health crisis uh, looming anyway, uh, even pre, pre the pandemic. But it's been massively exas exacerbated. It. Um, we need more mental health support in schools. We also need more mental health um, support outside of schools. I was shocked to discover recently. Uh, that when one of my uh, constituents' children had a, a serious mental health crisis, that there's not a single mental health bed uh, in Derbyshire for um, children. They were Their child was uh, being treated uh, 50 miles or more away. So we need to, there's a health aspect to this, um, but there's also, uh, as part of Labour's uh, childhood, uh, children's recovery plan, uh, a specific proposal to give every child the support they need to transition back to school uh, and uh, and to meet the personal challenges and recognise that, that there is really significant uh, mental health problems. And of course, in terms of the catch up, um, we know that the uh, the government's own uh, specialist on this, Kevin Collins, uh, resigned in disappointment at the government's response there. Uh, and if we, we've got uh, a generation of young people feeling like they're falling behind, worried about exams uh, and also feeling that the tutoring, that they're not able to access this tutoring, which is so important. Government estimating only 10% uh, of the targeted number are going to be receiving tutoring. Um, then there's kind of a, an escalation, these pressures on, on young people. The closure of schools really hurt children. I know Robert Halfon, he's on the other side to you, but he is determined with lots of support to ensure that they never close again. That's the right thing to do, isn't it? Well, I mean, absolutely. It, it, we need to do everything that we can do to keep schools open. I mean, it was uh, extremely damaging that schools shut for four months in, in 2020. We've seen... Um, the spot closures in January 21 uh, also. Um, we've also know that there's lots of schools where um, pupils are, are being sent home because of um, outbreaks in their schools. So there's been huge amounts of learning um, missed. There's large numbers of absenteeism uh, within schools with, with the number of teachers that are off. So, so in a whole variety of ways, teachers, 
um, children's learning has been uh, has has been damaged, um, and and that's why it's so important that there's real investment in this catch up plan. I think Kevin Collins' uh, original proposals were, were really sensible, uh, and and it's a huge disappointment that he's felt the need to resign because the government haven't taken uh, the, the scale of this um, learning loss seriously. Labour always talks about the need for more investment, uh, huge investment, I think were your words. Isn't the criticism of Labour that still, that they think the answer to everything is to spend more money and it doesn't grow on trees? Well, it certainly doesn't. And, uh, you know, when you've got oil and gas companies making uh, a single one, making £19 billion pound profit, quadrupling uh, their profits, and yet government say, no, you can't go to them and expect them to um, make any kinds of contribution. You know, we've got a government running the biggest uh, deficit, peacetime deficit in our history, got the highest tax rates uh, that we've had for 70 years, um, and have the audacity to come to the Labour Party and, and claim that we're the ones who don't understand understand the economics. We've had a, a long-standing history of a very successful windfall tax that we introduced um, back in the uh, late 90s. Uh, and I think that in the scale of the um, pandemic uh, bonuses that these oil and gas companies have, have come up with, um, the, the sort of proposals that we've come up with uh, on, in, in response to uh, the, the government's proposals are, are eminently sensible. Toby Perkins, Shadow Education Minister, thank you for your time this morning. Good to talk. Happy to be here. Now, Chancellor Rishi Sunak has announced some new measures this morning to help with the cost of living, but the cost of living is soaring. Our economics editor will be telling us what it means for us. And I have an incredible interview with Anna McMorrin MP about traumatic personal relationship and how she got out of it. First, it's the news. It's 12.30, I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Regulator Ofgem has announced a 54% rise in the energy price cap. Those on default tariffs paying by direct debit will see their bills rise by £693 to almost £2,000. The change to be introduced from April the 1st will affect around 22 million customers. Chancellor Rishi Sunak says he's introducing measures to remove the sting from the energy crisis. Meanwhile, energy giant Shell has managed to capitalise on the soaring gas and oil prices. The company recorded a pre-tax profit of £12 billion in the last three months of 2021. That's up from almost £900 million in the previous quarter. The Bank of England has raised interest rates to 0.5% and signalled more hikes are on the way as it tries to curb inflation. It marks the central bank's first back-to-back -back increase since June 2004. GB News understands Northern Ireland's First Minister Paul Given is planning to resign today. It comes amid increasing tensions over the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, with officials ordered to stop agri-food checks. That's potentially a breach of international law. Hauliers are calling for clarity as lorries are still being received, but it's not clear whether inspections are going ahead. Russia has criticised US plans to send more troops to Eastern Europe, describing the move as destructive. President Joe Biden has ordered nearly 3,000 military personnel to Poland and Romania to bolster NATO defences. Moscow has denied plans to invade Ukraine, but it's understood Russia's now mobilised 115,000 troops on its border. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We're back at the top of the hour after the break. It's back to the briefing with Claudia Di Prio. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. 
basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, today's major story and bad news for the pounds in our pockets. Energy bills set to rise by nearly £700 a year for the average household after the regulator raised the price cap by a whopping 54%. Customers will now be spending an average of nearly £2,000 a year on their energy bills. On top of that, interest rates are going up too. Let's get some analysis to that from Liam Halligan our economics editor, Liam. Good to be with you, Gloria, from a blustery seaside front in Blackpool. We're here for GB News North West Week. It's an iconic resort, but with the best will in the world, it's one of the less prosperous parts of the country. And we're going to be get, getting reaction to this news, as you say, of a really hefty hike in energy bills for households with many people having to choose, we're told, between heating and eating. Chancellor Rishi Sunak stood up in the House of Commons and he announced a major package of measures designed to help households that are struggling, not just those households on benefit, but also people who are working and struggling to make ends meet. He's talking about a £300 rebate on energy bills, taking the edge off that almost £700 increase, but that won't kick in until October, and you'll have to pay for it from your future energy bills. Plus, there's a council ta tax discount of £150 for households in bands A to D. So rather than the interest rate cut that we've been campaigning for on GB News, the Chancellor has chosen to target help on those who need it most via council tax by giving that rebate that won't need to be paid back to ha homes with a lower, as we say, rateable value. Some Conservative MPs still very, very concerned and angry, actually, about that tax rise, which uh, they seem to be going ahead with in April. Absolutely, and even at a time, really, of pretty big economic duress for the nation. These increases in energy bills are scary for lots of households. Let's not beat about the bush. This interest rate increase, almost a secondary issue, an, an interest rate increase for 2.2 million households with a variable rate mortgage. Even at that moment, Rishi Sunak was still stressing the need for fiscal responsibility. As I say, the main bulk of this energy support package isn't a grant to households. It's a rebate. He's, the government is lending money to the energy companies, many of whom are making huge profits, in order for them to pass on that loan, if you like, to households. It seems to me very complex, difficult to get your head around, lots of tinkering going on, rather than what I would have preferred, which is a straight across the board VAT cut. But, you know, I'm just a humble reporter. I'm not the Chancellor. And finally, uh, food bills up, interest rates up, fuel bills up. When will it stop, Liam? 
Well, Gloria, you and I in our respective shows have been talking about the cost of living for many, many months. You with your political antenna, me looking at household finances. This has been a crisis a long time in the making. Plus, as you say, that national insurance contribution increase coming in in April as well for both employers and employees. So you won't only pay more tax on your wages, you might not get a wage rise to reflect a higher cost of living because your employer's paying more tax too. It strikes me, yes, there's lots of parliamentary theatrics about Downing Street parties, cake and so on, and those things are very, very important. But as always happens, the economy now is moving centre stage. Liam Halligan, enjoy the seaside and thank you so much for that update. Thank you, Liam. Now, it's time for the latest in my series of interviews with MPs where we go behind the politics and get to know the real person. I talked to Shadow Victims Minister Anna McMoran about a traumatic personal relationship, how she got out and what advice she has for other women. Your Shadow Victims Minister. And there are things that you want to say today about a former relationship that you were in. Tell yeah. me about that relationship. So I think as a Shadow Victims Minister, every week, most days I speak to victims, women who are in or have been in awful abusive relationships, some unimaginable circumstances. And they're treated appallingly by the courts, by the justice system. That's why I want to speak about a past relationship that I've had that I feel need speaking about. Tell me about what you experienced in that relationship? So, I got into this relationship at quite a weak point in my life, uh, in terms of where I was headed. This person, I think, seemed to be giving me the support and the love initially you don't nobody gets into a relationship to um, not be loved I thought I'd found an incredible person and that we would be happy forever after it turned quickly to within a few months to more of a controlling relationship and that became very difficult one that became very difficult to a, understand what was happening, and B, to get out of. Tell me what you mean by a controlling relationship. Give me some examples. So I suppose using put-downs a lot. Like what? Using control of a situation, belittling me when I want to have certain opinions, um, telling me that I was going crazy when I tried to argue a different view, using a withdrawal and silent treatment as well as a punishment. All of these are quite small things, but added up day after day. You start living and in a state of permanent anxiety and stress and trauma, not knowing what's real and what's not. When did you first realise this was a pattern of behaviour? A few months into the relationship, when he lost his temper over something quite small and lashed out at me verbally. I was so shocked. I actually, I, I cried in front of him because I was so shocked at his, what I thought was an extreme response. In other relationships, normal, normalised relationships, 
you'd feel sorry, you'd feel some empathy. But he, he didn't. He would get angrier if I showed any emotion. And when I showed emotion, he got more angry. Almost disappointed. So then you start trying to hide your emotions and upset. And you start trying to do things that will please him. Because it's not all bad. And I think when I speak to victims of all manner of different abuses, and, and there are a lot of those, it's never all bad. It's never, there's always good points. You stay for a reason. But when you get into a relationship which is more coercive and controlling and manipulative, hugely toxic, then you wonder what is truth and what isn't. You question yourself because they are constantly questioning you and criticizing you, telling me I'm going mad, telling me I need mental health treatment because I lost my temper because he wound me up so much. That, that becomes the norm to live with, that stress and anxiety. How do you cope with that? What is the psychological impact of living in that kind of situation? So you almost become, there is a term which is trauma bonded, which is almost, it, it is normal to live with that trauma. You're constantly doing things to not upset the person. I, I tried not to upset him, but sometimes, you know, and I'm a quite strong will, willed individual and determined and educated and I pride myself on being a strong woman. So when you think, no, this isn't right, argue back and have those discussions. You're met not with a discussion or a debate, you're met with some manipulation or anger or someone moving the goalposts and that's what it's about moving the boundaries so you never know what is where the boundaries are and how it fits into your relationship what you suffered was emotional and psychological never physical never physical never physical but the scars linger as much as any physical ones yeah. would linger. Yeah, absolutely, which is why it's so important for victims out there. The law understands that coercive emotional abuse is a very real thing that women face and take a long time to get over the trauma of it. Did you talk to anyone about what you were going through? I talked to my friends. Did they get it? Yes. My good friends absolutely saw it. They understood it and they were there for me and they are why I got out eventually of that relationship. They're the ones who gave me the strength to get out. Did he ever diminish you in public or try and humiliate you in front of your friends? Were they witness to it? Yes. Yes, absolutely. In, in very small ways that no, there's no one element of this that you can point to and say, that means mm -hmm. this person and it is this type of emotional abuser. But absolutely um, belittling me, trying to joke or control, but in a, in a way that I think showed some of my friends that could see what was happening and didn't trust them at all. And you have children? Yes. You know, my, my children are incredible, amazing, strong individuals, and uh, they are really proud of me and how I got out of that relationship. I'm really proud of them, and I'm always, my first thought is them. And you're, you're much older than you look, just with people who are thinking, how old are our children? <laughs> So you're, you're 50. I'm 50. So your children are... It's a good age. <laughs> your children are... My children you know, are now 18 and 21. How did you get out? Was there a moment 
there was a moment, but I would say, it sounds even me, I don't understand how I stayed in this relationship because he had affairs that he denied completely, would absolutely deny it to me. And then he would delete the evidence of that I'd found trying to get in my phone one morning um, as I woke up and he deleted everything that I'd found of an affair so that I couldn't have anything to show that that would be my reality. Even after that, and he'd apologize and say it didn't mean anything, you're the person that I love. Because it's never all bad. Even after that, I asked myself why I stayed. I don't understand it myself. I don't understand why I, why did I do that to myself? And why did I do that to my children? And I don't, I don't know that answer, quite honestly, but it took all my strength to leave. It absolutely did. And I think that's the nature of this weird, the weird state that you get into when you're in a relationship like that. And I knew that I needed to go, because you know, you consciously know that this is not good. And I made a plan. And I made a plan and I stuck to it. It took me a bit longer than I thought, but you think you've got to have everything lined up. You think you've got to have everything in place in order to go. And I went out on a walk. It was um, a cold, dark, it was, it was dusk. And I just thought I need to go out and clear my head. Went out. And I just thought, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. And I rang one of my friends and, and she said, you're never going to do this, are you? You're never going to do, you're never going to go. It's never going to be right. You're never going to have the right time. You've just got to go. Go back now and tell him you're going. Just go back and tell him you're going. And she, she said, you've got to Beyonce it. <laughs> Imagine you're Beyonce, you gotta go in there and you just gotta go. Don't worry about everything. Don't worry about your stuff. Don't worry about your things. Then that's material. You've just got to go. And I did. That's what I did. I just thought, you know, and I knew that in my head. I knew that I just needed that little switch to go. Right, so I just went back in, I packed a small little bag and I just said, I'm going. And I walked out. What did he do? I, I don't think he believed me. Because we've had rows, of course, before, and, you know, and not, I had never left. He was angry when he saw me going. He'd never be, he'd, he's never been violent. He got angry, he got frustrated. And I just don't think he thought I'd go through with it. And he thought, even once I've gone, I think once I'd gone, he th thought I would come back. Have your friends been your therapy subsequently? Have yeah. you had need formal therapy to get through it? Yeah, my friends have been amazing. They were there for me um, and they continue to be there for me. Where did you go when you left? So I had lined up um, oh. somewhere. I'd lined up a flat, a little flat. But even lining that up, you know, and, and the, there was hardly anything there because I'd left everything mm. behind. And slowly, slowly I got I, man I did manage to get things out and got a few bits and pieces. And So for any woman who is watching, there's clearly some serious warning signs. Do you, do you want to, do you think they're universal, the warning signs or, or, or the nature of? Definitely, the, the definitely. There were red flags getting, getting into the relationship. Back then, there were red flags. Lots of people warned me. But I think with this kind of person, they assume another persona to you straight away. And they feel like they're, they're your partner. You're, you're the one that you're, you want to be with. They reflect back the things that are dear to you, that you're passionate about. Um, you know, he, he was intelligent and interesting and funny, 
but then comes the the change but by that time you're financially involved you're emotionally involved and it becomes much more difficult because that's the kind of person they are and I think what I would want any woman out there to know is that you can leave there are many people in these kind of relationships you don't need everything in place to go you just need to say now I need to get out and go and I think the other thing to remember is it's once you've gone it's not that that's not the easy bit it, it was so it, it was far easier to stay but once you've gone that that is the hard bit don't expect things to get easy straight away it takes time and there will always be part of you that always thinks and wonders what if was he really like that because again you quench, question your own sense of what was real what wasn't real what were those boundaries and that's when I turn to my friends and they say if you ever think of phoning him or want to go back phone me and you never have because you've never wanted to go back. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's hard. It's, it's always been hard, but, you know, you move on. But I, I think it's about telling women out there that they can do this. They can leave and that it isn't right. And we need a system in place to, A, make sure misogyny and sexism is spoken about, exposed. And misogyny in the workplace is made illegal or anywhere. Street harassment is made illegal, all of this. But we need to make sure that women feel empowered, that they can leave a relationship. And it's not easy. It's not easy. So it's OK not to leave straight away. It's OK to be in that relationship and plan. But take those steps and take the, write it down in one, two, three, three steps. What are those three steps? And do it. Anna McMorrin, I think what you have said today will help a lot of women, and I think it's very brave of you to do so. I hope so. Thank you. I hope so. Thank you so much. Very grateful to Anna McMorrin for being so open in talking to me there. You've been watching The Briefing with me, Gloria DiPiero. Isabel Oakshot will be here at noon tomorrow, and I'll be back on Monday. Up next, it's On The Money with Liam Halligan. He's in Blackpool as part of our North West Week. For now, I'll leave you with your weather forecast. Hello again. A mild one again today, but things are changing. Tomorrow's going to be an awful lot colder, and that colder weather will arrive after a wet and windy spell tonight. It's all coming from a cold front, which is approaching at the moment and will later today bring some heavy rain to the Western Isles and the Highlands of Scotland. But for most of us, it's another dry day. There's a lot of cloud around, but we are seeing some breaks in the clouds, so a bit of sunshine likely, parts of East Wales, the Midlands, North East England, Eastern Scotland seeing some breaks in the cloud, and even further south, we may at times see a little blue sky. But generally, cloudy, dry and mild, with a bit of a breeze blowing. Temperatures double digits, maybe 12, 13 degrees where we see some sunshine. But there's that rain coming into the far northwest later on. Could be quite heavy for a time, and it will start to turn to snow, initially over the mountains. It pushes southwards, that rain band, across into uh, northern England, parts of Wales overnight. So an hour or two of rain, and uh, for a short spell at least, that rain could be pretty heavy, again, falling as snow over the uh, Welsh mountains. Staying quite mild in the far southeast, but elsewhere it is going to turn colder, so it could turn icy as that band of wet weather moves through. And there is the possibility early tomorrow morning of a bit of snow over the Midlands, East Anglia, possibly parts of southern England, just for a time, not expected to last too long before that sweeps away. And then we've got sunny spells and showers. Those showers will be turning more and more wintry, initially over hills, but down to low levels from mid-morning onwards over northern England. Western parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland could also see a mixture of sleet and snow and a much colder feel as well, especially when you add on the strength of the wind. 
Still that wind's blowing through Friday afternoon, but easing down during Friday nights, and things could then again turn icy as we keep some showers coming into the northwest. A wintry mix of showers, a chilly start to what will be a windy weekend, wet in the north on Saturday, dry in the south. Showers for all of us on Sunday. Join me, Nana Aquir, on Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as my panel and I take on some of the top stories hitting the headlines. You can look up the statistics. No, you look it up. I hug everyone I oh. We learn from it and try and yeah. move on. That's it. <laughs> Opinion is at the heart of the show. It's a place for open and frank conversation, but without the fear of cancellation. So join me here on GB News on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons between 4 and 6 p.m. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.